Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Ricardo Gamboa, the creator and a host of the Hood Wazi. We are Chicago's uh, only and the country's only uh, radical live and live stream news show disseminating block optic and radical perspectives on culture and politics. And we are super excited to be bringing you this teaching series, Liberations in Black and Tan, that was incited by an eruption of racial tensions and brown on black violence that happened last uh, week during the uh, George Floyd protests. Uh, so we put this together to bring in uh, Latinx professors from across the country uh, to kind of talk about uh, the issues that are at the root and to also try and find ways to create multiracial solidarities and uh, black and brown uh, solidarity. Ladies and gentlemen, gender nonconforming and trans deities, thank you for tuning in to the Hurwazi. And we are in our third session for uh, this first day. Uh, it is entitled Mexicans in the Middle, uh, Mexicans in U.S. Racial Formation. And uh, our professor <laughs> for this afternoon is actually, uh, has a, gets a special intro because they are uh, my advisor at uh, NYU in American Studies. Um, I wouldn't be doing uh, most of the work that I'm doing right now if it wasn't for them, and I appreciate them so much. Um, they're a professor at NYU. Uh, of American Studies, and let's give it up for Josie Saldana. Uh, hi there, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. It is, I'm sure, a beautiful afternoon in Chicago, just as it is here, and so I'm grateful for you giving me your time. Um, I was invited by Ricardo Gamboa and the team from the Hudwazi to try and said, shed some light on the ambiguous racial standing of Mexicans and Mexican Americans in this country. Currently, there are an estimated 8 million Mexican citizens who uh, moved to the United States living here undocumented as a consequence of the devastating impact of NAFTA on Mexican small scale agriculture. The vast majority of those people who emigrated to the United States uh, after that are predominantly of indigenous descent or indigenous and peasant descent. And I'll return to this if there's time at the end of my talk, but I think it's really important, especially in the time of COVID, to recognize the essential work that undocumented workers do on behalf of the U.S. nation. Half of the agricultural workers in California are undocumented, uh, as well as half of those working in meat processing plants. So right off the bat, you can see that being Mexican is a pretty messy business in the United States, being Mexican American. To the average white American, when they say Mexican, they are not really making any distinction between, uh, while they might understand that Mexican Americans are legal, they aren't making any distinction between us when they talk about us. One of the things that I can bring uh, today to our conversation is a different deeper understanding of uh, how differences in the colonization of the Americas led to significant differences in how indigenous, Asian, black, white, and brown people were racialized. In other words, each colonial power, Spain, France, Portugal, England, Holland, imposed its own system of differentiating populations in the Americas that later ossified into racial categories and into the differential treatment of human beings based on race. Today, however, I will be talking about the differences between Spain and Britain, and subsequently after independence between Mexico and the United States. I want to preface this with three caveats which are extremely important. I am absolutely not saying that there is no anti-Black racism in Mexico or the rest of Latin America, because there most certainly is. And many of you have just heard from my brilliant colleague, Professor Gorgia Garcia Peña, about the deep history and legacy of anti-Black racism in Latin America. Uh, secondly, because of imperialism uh, the, of the United States globally, and because of our, our outside influence on global affairs, even minorities in the United States tend to universalize understanding uh, our understandings of racial formation onto the rest of the world. We tend to think that everyone sees race as we do, that all the world has followed the same patterns of racial discrimination that we have. This is understandable, but this kind of exceptionalism is no less a historical than any other kind of US exceptionalism. 
I am also not saying as a consequence that somehow Spanish colonialism was better than British or Anglo-American colonialism. What I am saying is that Spanish and British colonialism followed, followed very different rules for incorporating their others. And this has had long-term consequences for the legacy of race in both Mexico and the United States. And just as a quick example of this, as I imagine some of you know, Mexico's constitution recognizes that Mexico is a pluri-ethnic, plurilingual, and pluricultural in the second article. <laughs> so this, uh, this, this, so it officially recognizes the indigenous peoples in that article as the original inhabitants of Mexico. Uh, this is a change that was incorporated into the constitution in 1992 uh, as part of the celebration of the, well, celebration in quotations of the, uh, the quintessentennial of 1492. Uh, the Me Mexican legislature is also uh, or also just voted unanimously last year to officially recognize Afro-Mexicanos in the second article as well as part of the multi-ethnic nation. This is one example, like we would be really hard pressed uh, to imagine a U.S. constitution declaring in its second article that we're a multilingual and multi ethnic country. And what I'm trying to show today is that this is due largely to the differences in how uh, colonialism ruled in both countries, how the Spanish incorporated Africans and Indians into New Spain. But I want to reiterate again, I'm not saying that Mexico is somehow not racist just because these elements are in the Constitution, because as we all know, there is a huge gap between justice and what is instantiated in the law, right? So uh, this is a lecture in three parts. The first part is on comparative colonialisms, racial formations in New Mexico versus, in New Spain versus racial formation in Anglo-America, racial formation in the Southwest after the U.S. Imperial War of Aggression, and white by treaty, the history of Mexican-American racialization uh, in the Southwest and subsequently the country. Okay, so beginning with comparative colonialisms, there are two important differences with regard, with regard to race that differentiate the Spanish system from the Anglo-American system. Oh, uh, let's skip this, okay. Uh, from the Anglo-American system, and these are principally in how the crown classified indigenous peoples and enslaved Africans. So some of you may have heard of a concept called pureza de sangre, purity of blood. And what pureza de sangre meant in Spain uh, before empire and after for a number of, for two centuries, it meant that uh, people had, even though they had been exposed to Judaism and Islam, they had maintained themselves pure of those false beliefs. So people who had, uh, because remember, Spain itself was coming out of 800 years of, uh, of Islamic rule under the Moors. Uh, and so this is happening simultaneously as Spain is, is expanding into the Americas. And so for them, pureza de sangre meant that you had maintained your Christian faith. Uh, even in light of these false belief systems. And um, paradoxically, or, or perhaps what would be surprising is that indigenous peoples were also considered to have pureza de sangre because indigenous peoples by very virtue of the fact that they had quote unquote never been discovered before had never been exposed to Islam or Judaism. So uh, that, that put indigenous peoples in the unique positions of being equally pure as Spaniards. So pureza de sangre meant that you had maintained your whole family line free of Islamic or Juda Judaism, you know, free of these false beliefs. So this is why, because Indians were equally pure as Spaniards, this is why Spaniards were allowed to marry uh, indigenous nobility. They weren't just allowed to do so, they were encouraged to do so. And this wasn't just among the um, elite, this was also encouraged down the rank and file. If you uh, married an indigenous woman, you received more, you received land, right? Only the conquistadors, only the very elite received land grants. But if you married an indigenous woman and you were in the lower ranks, you too could receive land. And then there were also disincentives for not marrying your concubine. Like let's say you were in a relationship with an indigenous woman, the Catholic church would ban you from using any of the sacraments if you did not marry that woman. 
So, uh, you know, in order to be able to partake in communion and baptism and et cetera, et cetera, uh, you were encouraged, uh, you were either, you were thrown out of the church if you didn't marry those women who you were having affairs with, relations with. For uh, the Catholic Church, they saw this as a real opportunity for fulfilling their Petrian responsibility, uh, you know, upon this rock, you shall build my church, of extending the Christian uh, church, the Catholic Church, into to the indigenous peoples of the New World. And consequently, this meant that the Catholic priests worked very hard, right? They learned indigenous language, they Hispanicized the alphabets of indigenous language, so that, and then taught these Hispanicized alphabets to indigenous elites, so that indigenous elites could themselves function as scribes of empire, so that you could have communication between uh, you know, the very small portion of the population that spoke Spanish and the vast majority of the population that spoke indigenous languages. The Spanish uh, crown and church uh, divided indigenous people into indígenas so indios dociles, and those were the Indians that accepted Christianity and accepted Spanish uh, authority, at least pretended to, and those uh, the indios barbaros, who were those who refused to accept Catholicism or Spanish uh, governmentality. And, um, this is, uh, again, initially the terms pureza de sangre and indios barbaros were religious terms, but, you know, within a relatively short period of time, they morphed into what we understand them as today, which is biological terms that are steeped in racism. Uh, but it's important to remember that they originate in this kind of Christian, uh, this other meaning of racial purity, uh, religious purity. The fact that indigenous people had never been infidels, had never been exposed to Islam or Judaism, and had never converted, meant that they could not be enslaved according to Catholic doctrine, right? Because enslavement was reserved for people who had been, who were infidels, who the church had waged crusades against and who refused to co convert to Catholicism and so therefore could be declared infidel. So now this is where enter Africans. So uh, enslaved Africans uh, and Afro-Mestizos in New Spain. Uh, there's a very important difference between Spanish and Anglo-American enslavement. Uh, and again, it rests in the kind of determinant factor that Catholicism played in uh, the colonization of, of New Spain. Uh, the reason why you could enslave Africans from the point of view of the Catholic Church was because they were infidels. They had been exposed to Christ's teachings and had failed to take up Christianity, right? They might be Islamic, they might be Jude Jewish, or they might have other religions. They had had the opportunity to convert to Christianity and they had not taken it. And thus it was, according to Catholic Orthodoxy, justifiable to uh, enslave them. Now, let's remember that uh, not only had slavery existed in Europe for centuries, right? Uh, it had existed, the, the name slavery, in fact, comes from Europeans having enslaved Slavs who were predominantly, uh, who were predominantly is, is Islamic. So that's where the name slave actually comes from. But the other thing to that we often forget is that for the 800 years in which Spain was under Islamic rule by the Moors, the enslavement of black Africans by Northern Africans had been introduced into uh, the Iberian Peninsula through, the, uh, um, through Islam. Uh, and this is important because they had very different attitudes towards, uh, towards African enslaved Africans, right? In other words, they had, had, had lived among Africans for a very long time in Spain uh, and uh, enslaved and free, right? Not every African in, in Spain was enslaved. Um, and it, it meant that, um, the, also it meant Catholic Orthodoxy never ever assumed that Africans were not fully human. They absolutely were fully human within Catholic Orthodoxy, but they could be enslaved because they were infidels. So uh, this, what happens when Af Africans are enslaved and brought to the new world is that because the Catholic Church and Spain took its repeating responsibilities seriously, they baptized Africans en masse, either when they were getting onto slave ships or when they were getting off of slave ships. Yes, this is absolutely the height of irony and hypocrisy, but 
it gave enslaved people something that they did not have in the United States. And this was the right to fully enjoy all of the sacraments. Enslaved peoples, because they were Christian, because they had been baptized as Christian, had the right to enjoy all the sacraments. And most importantly, the sacrament of marriage, which meant that they had the right to freely choose their spouses. And of course, enslaved people, <laughs> quick studies, uh, they, uh, the male enslaved peoples immediately began choosing indigenous and Spanish wives because the fruit of their wombs would be born free. This had two very, very concrete effects. The first was that you couldn't separate families just because they were enslaved. In fact, they had the right to sacred union and therefore you couldn't. And uh, this is really getting into the weeds, but you know, Spain had two uh, different court systems. So an enslaved person could take a court against, it could take a case in the, in, in the Crown's court against their employer because they were if, if negatively affecting their, uh, their sacramental rights. And if they lost in that court, they would go and appeal to the Catholic court. And the Catholic court overruled the Crown court. So there are many cases documented in New Spain where you have the establishment of the family unit as the sacred, even if they're enslaved or, or, or mixed, or mixed, you know, enslaved and non-enslaved uh, families. Now, the other effect, the other concrete effect, is that very, very quickly, um, there is a huge free Afro-Indigenous and Afro-Mestizo population. By 1710, the free Afro-Mestizo population is 130,000 while the white population, that is Creoles and Peninsulares, are 125,000. And why is this an important big date, like 1710? Because in 1710, New Spain decides to end, to end the importation of any new enslaved peoples, right? So uh, at that moment in time, it, it's a very important moment in time, because at that moment in time, when you have roughly 255,000 uh, uh, free Afro mestizos and whites, you have uh, an estimated six million indigenous peoples in New Spain, just New Spain. What does this mean? It means that those people who we call mestizo in Mexico today are at least as likely to be descendants of Africans as they are to be descendants of Spaniards. I mean, numerically, that just has to be the case. But also, the vast majority of Mexicans living in Mexico today are not actually products of miscegenation. Though Mexico may politically, for all sorts of racist motives against indigenous people, like to portray itself as a mestizo nation, it is actually an indigenous nation with a smattering of mestizos, whites and blacks, living among indigenous peoples. The vast majority of the Mexican population in other words, did not mix with those 250,000 mestizos and whites, right? It's just, it, it just numerically, that would have, they would have been have to be very, very busy to have actually mixed with all of those indigenous people. So the vast majority of Mexicans are what we would consider Latinized Indians. That is people whose entire genetic makeup is 100% indigenous, but who no longer identify with a specific indigenous ethnicity. What makes a person indigenous in Mexico, uh, even though this too is changing, it's, it's, it's very clear. It's what language do you speak? What uh, clothing do you use? What modes of local governmentality, what they call usos y costumbres, do you practice? And what cargos or, or, or charges do you hold or offices do you hold for your communities? This is how you maintain your indigenous identity and it's tied to a very specific pueblo so in other words there are i don't know more than a million mayans in mexico but those mayans although they understand themselves to be mayan their principal identification is with the town they are from this is how seriously <laughs> these are the costa paintings and this is how seriously the spaniards uh took racial admixture, right? Even as this painting is privileging all these mixtures as recognized forms of sacred family units, there's nevertheless a very clear, uh, 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 you know, racial discrimination just in the terms they use, right? You know, there's a lot of um, 
uh, uh, racializing thought even in this celebration from the Spanish point of view of the castes. The thing about uh, mestizos, right, who are really mestizos, you know, people, what are what is the race of those who truly are mestizos, who truly are descendants of these uh, mixtures that did happen among some of the population in Mexico? What is their race? Well, that's a really difficult thing to adjudicate. And I mean, in Chicano culture and Mexican American culture, we have a saying, and that is that we all come from Pinto bean families, because like the Pinto bean, you will have in one mestizo family, every shade of black, brown, red, and white, just like a pinto bean, which also happens to be the bean of choice of the Southwest. You know, not of the interior of Mexico, but of the Southwest. So whereas Spaniards and Indians were considered pure, and therefore Spaniards and Indians, for example, uh, could own land, Casta's rights and obligations were really limited because of the fact that they were mixed. People who were in the middle, people who were castas, could not own land, they could not uh, exercise certain professions or guilds, and they certainly couldn't hold any administrative office. This discrimination against, against the castas, what these people of mixed ancestry could or could not do, is what caused them to be the major colonizers of the northern providences of New Spain, what today we call the Southwest. Up to 25 to 50 percent of all of the settlement in the northern provinces of New Spain were populated by mestizos and afro-mestizos. They did this because if you moved on the bo to the borderland, as is often the case of the borderland, law was a lot looser, right? You could own land, you know, so you could have your little ranchito. You could hold office. You could uh, vote. You know, miscegenation, of course, continued in these places, as one would imagine. And so, you know, these Afro mestizos and mestizos married uh, Indios from these areas. You know, the Navajo, the Apache, the Kiwa, all the Pueblo Indios. So, this is the scene in northern New Spain, which will become the Southwest, uh, and at the time of independence. So, independence took ten years, uh, from 1810 to 18. 1821, but when it did occur, uh, Mexica, the Mexican Constitution declared all males, uh, white, be they white, indigenous, or free Afro Mestizo, to be equal in front of before the law, and we recognized them in the Constitution. And, 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 and uh, it, in, it did not, the Constitution at that point point did not end enslavement of, uh, of, of people in Mexico. There were approximately 40,000 uh, enslaved peoples in the Yucatan Peninsula, uh, with the caveat that all children who were born to those 40,000 would be free. So their thinking when they dropped the Constitution is that within a generation, all of these would be free. Of course, it's moot because uh, of just uh, three years after the Constitution is written and declared, Vicente Guerrero, the third president of Mexico, who is himself after Mestizo, declared all enslaved peoples free in 1829. This is what happens on the eve of the U.S. war of aggression against Mexico uh, in 18, uh, that should be 1846, sorry. What would it mean, though, if we thought of the, of, of the U.S. the war of aggression against Mexico to be at least as important as the Civil War? And now remember, the United States gets one third of its land mass from that war, right? But what is the nature of that war? That's a colonial war. That is an imperialist war. There is no redemptive history that can be written if you center, if you give that war equal weight. I mean, it's a beautiful thing to talk about how we ended, we finally ended slavery, you know, in 1865, but it's a very different thing if you put these two wars in conversation with each other. Because at the same time that we were freeing the enslaved, we were also in annexing uh, in a war of aggression, you know, half of the, half of the, half of, half of Mexico. What happened to the mass of people who were annexed, the mass of Mexicans who were annexed? Uh, well, the majority of, when Mexico signs the treaty, obviously under duress, they, were, they lost the war and give up half of their territory. What they, in, what is in uh, articles uh, eight and nine of the treaty uh, is that um, Mexicans in, in, uh, in annexed into the United States would continue to enjoy all of the rights of citizens, all of the rights of citizens. But uh, that means property, voting, holding office, et cetera, that they enjoyed as Mexican citizens. 
So they incorporate articles eight and nine. Uh, there's the protests going on outside my window. I don't know if you can hear them. Go! So what ends up happening instead though, however, is that uh, the, when the U.S. annexes these people, they simply cannot believe that uh, Mexicans considered Afro-Mestizos and indigenous to be fully human and fully citizen. After the U.S. Civil War, um, the, uh, the, the, the Naturalization Act of 1870 declares that only whites and blacks can become U.S. citizens, can naturalize as U.S. citizens. Right? This is in recognition to the end of the Civil War. But that's not a benign act. It's not just a coincidence. I mean, that, that they, they choose that language very, very, very uh, explicitly. Because they simply could have said that everyone in, who comes to the United States can be naturalized regardless of race or creed. But, in fact, the Congress spends a lot of time arguing that it cannot use that language. It cannot say that anyone coming to the United States can be naturalized because we'll be overwhelmed by the Asian hordes, that's their language, obviously, not mine, or that will have to extend citizenship to Native Americans. Remember, Native Americans don't get citizenship in this country until 1924. So, you know, it's it's this crazy, you know, logic that says that, you know, absolutely only blacks and whites can naturalize for citizenship. So what happens to this, this category of Mexican who, whether or not they are actually miscegenated, understand themselves as a racially mixed collection, a motley crew of peoples? Well, the first case for naturalization is in Rey Rodriguez in 1896 by a Mexican uh, who, who was actually an immigrant. He hadn't been annexed. He had immigrated from Mexico into Texas. And he, uh, he uh, tries to be... Uh, he makes a petition to be naturalized and uh, the the court denies the lower court denies it and so when he takes it up to the state court the state court rules in his favor but not because he thinks that that Ricardo Rodriguez is white this is what the judge decides Ricardo Rodriguez is clearly one of these Latinized Indians who is has already accepted the racial ideology of Mexico that all Me all Mexicans are Mexican, you know, he's a pure-blooded Mexican. Of course he knows he's not an Aztec because, you know, the Aztecs are the Nahuas people and he probably knows enough to know that whatever his indigenous ancestry, it wasn't Nahuatl, you know, it wasn't Nahuas. So, uh, but my point here is like, the judge decides that he's white because of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, that he has the right to naturalize, that he's white by treaty. But clearly, even in that decision, the judge is absolutely flummoxed by his racial character. And the racial character of Ricardo Rodriguez comes into, you know, comes into his whiteness, even as it's declared that he can naturalize, that Mexicans and by extension other Latinos can naturalize. They're considered part of the white race. But my argument or what I'm trying to suggest to you is that being white, it came with this tinge of the copper colored red man, right? I mean, Mexicans were white by treaty, but they weren't really white. If you wanted to maintain your land, maintain your right to vote, or maintain your right to hold office, and you were in the annexed territory and you were Mexican, you had to prove you were white. Literally go to court and establish that there was no more than one thirty-second, thirty-second. 32nd, I don't even know how you say it, that you were no more than one thirty-second either black or indigenous. But this is part of the reason why you have this kind of historical suspicion of Mexicans, I think, right? Because you have this incentive within the law to identify with whiteness if you want to be recognized and fully enfranchised, right? Now there's, I'm sorry, the third part of the lecture we never got to because that's the part of the civil rights cases where, you know, initially civil rights attorneys uh, argue and win that Mexicans have been discriminate, discriminated as another white group. And in 1972, they changed their tactic. They insist they're another, Mexicans are another minority, a racial minority, an ethnic minority. They win a case in 1972, and that changes everything. But so one of the things I'm, I'm asking is because it seems like right now we're at this moment where so much of Latinidad um, is just being imagined as white if it is not black. Right, and I think that there's some advantages to that, like Lorgia talks about, right? The, the necessity to recenter indigeneity and blackness in in conceptualizations of Latinidad, right? But I'm saying that because how 
I think that right now, when even when we think about Mexicans, I would argue that the majority of them in the U.S. are brown, not because precisely like you said, eight million of them are coming from indigeneity. But can you speak to a little bit about that U.S. racial binary thinking and um, the low social location of Mexicans and Mexican Americans in the U.S.? Well, I mean, I do think that um, the that's what I was saying. Like the 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 ideology in Mexico is one of mestizaje, which has its own inherent racism right because it privileges the mixture the person who's been mixed with whiteness over the indigenous right but it privileges mixture in the united states we abjure mixture right i mean until relatively recently biraciality wasn't even a category that was recognized it's i mean i think it just got on the census like one or two censuses ago right so you know, you were either white or you're black, you were either indigenous or you were white or you were black, you know, in other words, there, is, there isn't the one drop rule in Mexico. And I think that that makes it very confusing for a lot of, of, of Latinos, like not beyond Mexicans, right? Because there are there are Latin American countries where it's really majority afro mestizo and Latin American countries where it's majority indigenous and Latin American countries where it's majority white, right? So even within Latin America, depending on how colonization takes place, you have real differences. So, I mean, I think that the U.S. Latino is, and, you know, even more specifically the Mexican American, it's just, it places a kind of concept, an epistemological challenge. Like, what does it mean when you are, you know, actually the descendant of, you know, both white and indigenous peoples, or when you're actually the descendant of indigenous peoples, but somewhere along the way, you simply lost your indigenous cultural habits, right? I mean, there is not a, that there's the US system of racialization cannot recognize either of those two categories. This is why I wanted to bring in the issue of like, when the United States Congress had a choice of saying, let's simply enfranchise everyone, they said, oh, no, 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 no. We don't want to let the brown people in, right? We don't want to let the yellow and the brown people in. We don't want to let the red people in. We just want whites. We have to let in blacks, and we only want to limit it to white and black. So racialization in this country has never been a bipolar thing. Another thing that's always very important to cite, in the Southwest, between 1870 and 1930, Proportionally, you know, Mexicans were lynched at the same rate as African Americans in the South, right? Again, because who are who are the other in the Southwest? It's the Mexicans, right? That's who you're going to lynch. You know, blacks aren't numerous enough to even be a threat at that point, right? So who do you lynch? You lynch the Mexicans. Where would you say some of the key openings uh, Mexican Americans and more broadly Latinos have right now? to further radical change in the U.S.? Where are some of like the, the, the when, you, when you key in, you know what I mean, like some of the issues or solidarities or affinities there are to be mined? I think that two things that immediately spring to mind, uh, one is just, you know, the importance of, you know, uh, uh, transforming immigration laws so that all of these uh, undocumented people can be enfranchised and, and hopefully uh, these uh, hopefully after November we might be able to have a conversation about that. Also, the elimination of um, IRA IRA, which are the category that IRA IRA was passed in 1996, and it criminalized all sorts of very low grade behavior uh, that gets you deported if you're an undocumented immigrant or if you're a documented immigrant, right? So all of this huge, huge panoply of like low level drug crimes gets you deported. And that, you know, that, that, these are people who have lived their whole lives in the United States. They might be undocumented, but they really are U.S., you know, and they get deported because of these. So changing immigration, changing deportation laws, that's a very important, for me, point of, uh, of, 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 of activism. Between African-American and Latinos, changing the drug laws. Like what we see as the kind of militarization of the police in the United States that is a consequence of police stations being sold, all of the excess equipment in these like wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, that's why our, our police forces got so militarized because there's all of these excess of war goods and they're selling them to these departments, right? And so one of the ways that we can, we can combat, like remembering that the ending, you know, defunding the police has to go beyond 
just those the, the police in, uh, police brutality against U.S. citizenships. We have to think of it globally, right? How did this? How does this police brutality also impact the way in which ICE runs its detention centers, right? The fact that ICE was called, the ICE agents were called and were some of the most brutal, brutal people called to Washington, D.C. to put down the protest so that the president could have his photo off, right? So that's, that's all one economy. Detention, incarceration, that's one economy. Do you think we're getting to a place where, we, where activism will be taking on more kind of transnational, global proportions? I hope so. I hope so. I mean, you know, uh, if we attack drug laws here and drug that then by extension, if we decriminalize the use of drugs here, then by extension, why are we criminalizing in Latin? Why are we criminalizing in Latin America? And you have a lot of Latin American heads of state that as soon as they leave office, what do they say? Let's legalize it, man. This is bullshit. You know, as soon as they get out of office, they're very happy to talk about legalizing it continentally. Already in between like the sessions, we've just been getting so much response. So like next year, I was like, yo, we're gonna do this again, but we're just gonna bring these professors out here to do some work. Which I'm just letting you know that. So okay. you I'm can also start planning. happy to come back next weekend. I mean, I'm <laughs> in my home just like you guys are. So, yeah. <laughs> Great. Well, we might hold you to that. I want to thank you so much. Everybody put your um, emoji clap hands together uh, for uh, Josie Saldana. Um, check out um, nyu.edu backslash SCA um, for more of her publications. We'll be sharing them as well. I'm going to drop a uh, link uh, for you all to give us some feedback on how you felt about the session and what you learned um, in the Facebook comments and also um, uh, in the Zoom chat. And thank you so much, Josie. And we'll oh, be seeing you, you soon. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye. <laughs>